This is the first lecture on Bartholomew Fair. Eleven people, ordinary Londoners, one day decide to go to Bartholomew Fair. Some of them come back the same as they were when they left. Others come back, change forever in ways they never could have expected. This is the plot of Johnson's Bartholomew Fair. And just as the alchemist dealt with change and luck, uh, so, does, so does Bartholomew Fair. The big difference is that in The Alchemist, we, as in Volpone, we have a group of con men at the very center of the play. In this one, we, we really don't. We meet con men when we go to Bartholomew Fair, but they are simply the agents of change. The characters who we're mainly interested in are these 11 people who go to the fair and what happens to them there. So this was a very popular play uh, when it was first produced in uh, 1614. And it remained a popular play uh, during the Restoration, after the theaters reopened. Remember, the theaters were shut for nearly 20 years uh, under, under the Puritans. Essentially, zeal of the land and uh, tribulation of wholesome won in England for about 20 years, but uh, that didn't last. So. Johnson takes us on a fun day to the fair. This is probably, of all of the plays that you're going to be reading this semester, the one which will tax uh, your reading abilities uh, farthest. It's going to be the one where you will need to spend some time with the footnotes. But let's just take a kind of um, overview of this play uh, and have a kind of a... Um, template that you can follow as you're, you're getting through it. Now the way to do this is to uh, look at the characters. I'm going to try to find my handout quick here. Well, I don't see it, so I'm just going to have to remember it. Um, you, the way to start this play is to think of various character groupings and to track these character groupings and what happens to them throughout the play. So the first character grouping that we're going to meet is the family of John Littlewit. Okay. Uh, Littlewit is a proctor, which means that he is a minor uh, court official. He's not quite a lawyer, uh, but he can do some legal things, and one of the things that he can do is draw up marriage licenses. So we're going to meet him at the beginning of the play and find out that he is drawn up a marriage license for Bartholomew Cooks. And Little Wit thinks that this is a great laugh because that day is Bartholomew Fair Day and Bartholomew is coming to get the license. So, ha ha, we've got a funny coincidence here. Um, Little Wit is continually cracking awful jokes in the beginning uh, of that first act. And we find out that he's relatively brainless, even though he thinks he's pretty smart. So unlike Shakespeare's fools, Little Wit is the kind of fool who really is Little Wit, that has Little Wit. Um, we're going to also find out that Little Wit is a playwright. Little Wit has written a play, and it's going to be performed that day at Bartholomew Fair. And he wants to go to that play, but he's, he's got some trouble with getting there. Uh, perhaps this is the time that I should say something about Bartholomew Fair. Bartholomew Fair was a, an ancient fair by the time uh, Johnson wrote the play. It had uh, been in existence since 1183. Uh, finally, in 1855, it was discontinued because it got too rowdy. There was too much crime connected with it. Um, it, it lasted for one day, and uh, it would be very much like the Fresno County Fair without the rides, no rides, but lots of people hawking all different kinds of stuff, almost all of it junk. Uh, teddy bears, toys, uh, junk food, uh, entertainments, places where you could have a drink, places where you could eat pig. There would be a lot of merchants there, a lot of merchants selling stuff. This is how fairs became uh, uh, established in England. They were actually really big markets and fairly important ones, uh, both for sellers and for buyers. So that's that's Bartholomew Fair. And, you know, even in Johnson's day, it had the reputation of being, well, kind of like our fair, a place where um, 
you, you were likely to get cheated, but if you were having fun, maybe you didn't really care that much. Um, you play a few games at the fair. You don't expect to win. Uh, you're throwing money away often, even if you do win. Uh, it's all part of the going to the fair experience. So, you know, Johnson basically has a lot to say about fairs, a lot to say about having fun in this play. Uh, but we'll leave, we'll leave that off for a while. I'll get my brain back to uh, Little Wit's family. His mother-in-law is Dame Purecraft. Dame Purecraft uh, and pretty much her family are Puritans. She sets the moral tone for the family. She has a lot of power in that family. Uh, it seems that Little Wit and his wife, Wynn, Dame Purecraft's daughter, are living uh, with uh, Dame Purecraft, and, and she has a substantial amount of money, uh, and not all of it gotten honestly, we find out. So um, we have Dame Purecraft, who is a widow, and we have her daughter, Wynne, who is pregnant, and John Littlewit's strategy to get to the fair is that pregnant women get urges to eat certain things. And even though Dame Purecraft, as a Puritan, would be against going to the fair, and the man who has come to visit them, and has been there for the last three days, a Puritan baker, zeal of the land, busy, has nothing good to say about the fair. John is fairly smart, in this way at least. Uh, he thinks that he can get them there if Wynne longs to eat pig. So he tells her, Wynne, long for pig, and Wynne longs for pig. Uh, and this is going to be enough to get them uh, off to the fair. So that's, that's family group number one. John, Wynne, Dame Purecraft, and Zeal of the Land Busy, a very hypocritical, bombastic, biblical-sounding Puritan, uh, the worst that Johnson could come up with, um, the most detestable from Johnson's viewpoint that he could come up with. Uh, second group. Second group is the Bartholomew Cook's group. Bartholomew is, is a very foolish character. He's uh, 19 years old. He seems like he's closer to 9 or 10, if that. Uh, in, in many ways, he is the perfect person to go to Bartholomew and uh, a fair and enjoy it. Uh, if you're ever a kid, a, a little kid, and you've been to a fair, you want to play all the games, you want your dad to win a teddy bear for you, uh, you'd spend all your money if you had it to spend in the first few hours, that's Bartholomew Cooks. So the connection between his name and the, and the name of the fair is not at all accidental. Bartholomew was made for Bartholomew Fair. Uh, his unfortunate prospective wife is Grace Wellborn. Grace, we find out, is a ward of Adam Overdue, the husband of Mistress Overdue. Uh, Adam Overdue is a justice of the peace. Um, so uh, there, was a, there was a very bad legal practice at the time where if you uh, became an orphan, and your parents uh, were tenants on crown lands, that a person could actually, in a sense, purchase you. They, they could purchase your guardianship and become your step-parents, whether you wanted them to or not. And then they had the power uh, to arrange a marriage for you, I suppose, unless, unless you split, like some of Shakespeare's heroines do. But... Um, they were given management of your property, and so they could often come out financially ahead in that deal. It was a, really a way of exploiting people, and it was done away with uh, in the mid middle of the 17th century, actually, by the Puritans. When the, when the Puritan, Puritan parliaments were in session, uh, they saw how corrupt it was, and they got rid of it. So Grace, unfortunately, uh, has been sucked into this trap. And her guardians are the overdues, and they have decided that she is going to marry Bartholomew Cooks, because Cooks is the brother to Mistress Overdue. And that way they can kind of keep Grace's property in the family. Okay, so she's, she's really being exploited in this play. So, 
Second family grouping um, concludes Bartholomew. Cooks, uh, Mistress Overdue, Grace Wellborn. Obviously, these names uh, give you a hint to the characters. And one other very important character, Humphrey Wasp. Humphrey Wasp is kind of like a pedagogue. The pedagogue was the Greek or Roman slave who made sure they were given charge of, of one of the of a son in the family of, of their master, and uh, their orders were to make sure that kid got to school, uh, make sure he got home, make sure he didn't get into trouble, and whack him if he got out of line. The slaves had that power. Humphrey Wasp is the caretaker of the perpetually childlike Bartholomew Cooks, except that Cooks is getting too old for uh, Humphrey Wasp to manage. The joke here is that Cooks would try the patience of even a very patient person, and Humphrey has no patience at all. He's of a very choleric, angry disposition. He gets angry very, very quickly, and so this is a complete mismatch, and uh, it forms some of the comedy of the play. So there's group two. Group three, two men, Tom Corliss uh, and Ned Winwife. Ned is chasing widows because he doesn't have a real big income. He wants some money. And uh, he is a suitor to Dame Purecraft. Uh, she's a bit too old for him. He doesn't care as long as some money goes with it. He's been trying to do this for a while. And uh, Corliss tells him at the beginning of the play that he should just leave off. He hasn't had any luck so far. Um, both of these guys are smart, perceptive, experienced. They, in a way, are, are our eyes and ears on stage during the play. They see everything that needs to be seen. They make the same kinds of comments that the audience would uh, probably make. And so they're very much like a chorus in this play. But some very interesting things happen to them as well. Because what's going to happen, I might as well, I'll, I'll give it up now, um, Winwife is going to wind up marrying Grace Wellborn. And, uh, and through a, a series of accidents, you might say, Corliss is going to wind up marrying Dame Purecraft, which is going to work out for them just fine, too. Um, so those are some, some of the transformations that are going to happen at this day at, at Bartholomew Fair. One other group composed just of one person, Adam Overdue, who we don't get to meet until Act 2, Scene 1. Overdue is a uh, justice of the peace, and I suppose like a lot of judges, uh, he gets frustrated because of the difficulty of sifting good evidence from bad evidence and coming up with a verdict that's accurate. So he wants to go straight to the source. He knows since there's all kinds of crime at Bartholomew Fair. I'm the justice of the peace in charge of Bartholomew Fair. So I'm going to go to the fair undercover and see what's going on and collect evidence and watch people so that now when I make my judgments, they'll be correct. And people everywhere will sing the praises of Adam Overdue, who went underground and... Um, uh, as a character named uh, Arthur of Bradley and discovered everything and came up with all the right, right judgments. And uh, he's a reader of Greek and Roman literature, especially Roman, and he is building, building this undercover scheme on a bunch of stories about uh, judges or kings who did the same thing. And also Shakespeare had a plot like this in Measure for Measure, which Johnson certainly knows about. And there were several other Renaissance plays before this where a judge went underground to find out the truth of, of matters. Overdue is going to be particularly bad at this. Okay, So those are the basic character groupings, and they're going to run into a slew of other characters at the fair who I will talk about more in uh, lecture two. And uh, some of them are going to get cheated. Um, Funny things are going to get going to happen. Uh, we're going to have all sorts of mix-ups, near misses between characters who might want to be talking to each other as we move toward the end of the play. Um, one other thing. Okay, one other thing about character structure. Um, and by the way, I should have mentioned this at the beginning of the lecture. Um, 
I have a handout on this, so you can flow what I'm saying on the handout. I will uh, mention that in a, in a note uh, that I attach to this lecture. Um, not only do we have these different character groupings, but we have parallel groupings of characters, and these are especially interesting. Um, first of all, we have two fools, two people who kind of perform the same function uh, and end up in the same place together. One is Little Wit, and the other is Bartholomew Cooks, the two people who really want to be at the fair, who really enjoy the fair, um, and uh, at the end just have the experience have the experience of the, of the fair. Uh, Little Wit is the writer of the puppet play. Bartholomew Cooks is his biggest fan. They just naturally come together. Then we have three opponents to the fair. Adam Overdue, Zeal of the Land Busy, and um, Humphrey Wasp. Overdue is against the fair because he thinks it's a sink of crime, and uh, he'd like to get underneath it and, and kind of blow it up for that reason. He is... Uh, He's the legal opponent of the fair. Zeal of the Land Busy is the uh, hypocritical religious opponent of the fair, uh, who would really like to shut down mirth, or seemingly shut it down, as long as it's other people's mirth and not his, um, all over the country. Wasp is an opponent of the, of the fair because it threatens the person he's in charge of, uh, Bartholomew Cooks, and it also threatens his control over that person. All of these three are going to wind up in the stocks together. They're all going to be punished, in a sense, for their opposition to the fair. Uh, the other pair, as we've already we've already paired them, Corliss and Winwife, who are going to wind up with wives when they get home from the fair. Uh, two more that naturally pair are Win. Uh, Little Wit's wife, Win Little Wit, and uh, Grace Wellborn. Uh, they are the young women. Uh, they are both, in a sense, the daughters of the two older women in their family. Dame uh, Purecraft is Win's mother. Uh, Mistress Overdue is, in a sense, Grace Wellborn's stepmother. At least she's the, the most important female authority in your life. So we have those groupings. And um, understanding the groupings will help you understand some of the things that are going on in the play that are thematic. Um, one thing which is just obvious uh, is that uh, Johnson thinks the fair is a good thing. Johnson likes the fair. He thinks people should be able to enjoy themselves in this way. Uh, people who oppose these kinds of entertainments, in a sense, are demanding that we be more than human. And Johnson is a, Johnson's a tolerant kind of guy. He basically says, let's be human. Let's be human and take our pleasures, however imperfect they may be, where we can find them, so long as they don't do any real harm, any major harm. Um, so this will serve as the intro lecture to The Alchemist, and now we'll start looking at some of the action in the acts more closely. <laughs>